everyone, <laughs> and welcome to the Unity Center. Today, we are very fortunate to have Avaro Rodriguez to lead us in a uh, discussion on um, what I would call capitalism. Um, the actual title is An Introduction to Political Economy. Um, Alvaro will lead us in that. And um, he raises two questions uh, at, at the very start in, in announcing this presentation. Um, he talks about understanding the root cause of capitalism and why that is important. And then another one is, and this is a question, why try to understand capitalism if our goal is socialism? And I thought that that's very, a very interesting question and one that's uh, worthy of thought. So I think uh, with Averro's uh, presentation and our discussion as we dig deeper into this, maybe we'll even have a better understanding of why uh, understanding that question is so important for us uh, as activists. Um, Alvaro is with us from Texas via webinar. And uh, I've seen this presentation, heard this presentation once before. And it's, 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 it's very good and very uh, thought provoking. So uh, Alvaro, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shelby. Thanks for, for that introduction. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Chicago Club for this invitation to participate in this discussion of something that I feel is very important for for the party and uh, for the movement. It, um, so uh, let me go ahead and get started. Uh, we call this an introduction to political economy. It's actually a short title. Uh, it should be an introduction to Marxist polit uh, critique of political economy, because that's what it really is. And by critique, it, does, it doesn't mean just a, a criticism of capitalism. It's, it's basically an understanding and a, uh, a critique uh, or a criticism of, of capitalism. So it has to be both. We need to understand the system that oppresses us uh, in order to change it. So uh, it's basically it's an introduction to the uh, Marxist uh, critique of political economy. Uh, so here, I, I want to go over some norms in terms of what uh, what we're going to do here. Uh, uh, First of all, uh, I think uh, Shelby already mentioned that my name is Alvaro Rodriguez. Uh, I'm from Houston. I'm the district organizer in uh, Texas. Uh, it, uh, I'm not an economist by training. Uh, I am an engineer. Uh, I worked in the point of production all my working life uh, in the petrochemical industry in the Texas Gulf Coast. It's the largest petrochemical industry in the whole world. It, uh, so I've had an opportunity to work in a lot of what we call the process industry. It's chemicals, oil production, gasoline, uh, and specialty chemicals. So I've worked with equipment, uh, fixed equipment, what we call pressure vessels, uh, uh, towers, uh, distillation towers, uh, uh, in the site, maintenance side and also in, in the design and material special, specialization. Uh, I was also a... a very good uh, failure cost analysis person. So I went around the world uh, solving technical problems associated uh, with the petrochemical industry. So uh, I'm pretty good at uh, identifying root cause of failure analysis uh, in production through an analytical process. And um, so I would certainly like to apply some of that to some of this presentation as, we're, as we go through it. Um, I remember very well that D said that in, in a lot of these classes, we need to make sure that we get uh, two or three ideas out there and make sure that we we concentrate on those. We don't want to put too much information out there. I just want to alert you that certainly this is a very brief introduction to political economy. Uh, I, I got here if, a volume one of Capital. It's very thick and fine print. Uh, I know how, how in-depth it goes because uh, when I was uh, younger, uh, we were very ambitious and we would set up a study group where we would sit down and study Capital, Volume 1, uh, page by page. We would meet every weekend and, and do that. And I'll tell you, it's it's pretty rough because uh, Marx uh, wrote in the language of the, you know, in the 1980s, I mean, the 1880s. Uh, 
Also, uh, he was writing for other technical uh, political economists of the time, uh, other revolutionary leaders. Uh, so it wasn't a popular pamphlet. It was not meant to be, not like uh, the Communist Manifesto. Um, so anyway, uh, this uh, webinar is scheduled for one hour, 30 minutes for opening, and uh, 30 minutes or so for questions and comments. Uh, we're learning together here, so uh, don't don't expect me to have all the answers. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of comrades there in Chicago and, and uh, on the webinar that uh, can help answer some of these uh, very tough questions. There is not one common understanding of uh, uh, political economy. Uh, in fact, uh, we have not only in, in the, the capitalist economists, but also even Marxist uh, economists, we have uh, their uh, two-handed economists, uh, on the one hand this and on the one hand that. So uh, uh, this is an oversimplification of something that's really very, very uh, uh, complex. And uh, just because it's complex doesn't mean that it's not important. It is extremely important, but it is a, a complex topic and it's very fun, fundamental. And we'll talk about how fundamental it is to uh, uh, all the other uh, superstructure in our society. Um, now, I hope that Dee or someone there in Chicago would help uh, kind of uh, moderate some of this discussion and, and the questions so that we can get the maximum uh, uh, learnings uh, from, from the discussion. So we'll go back to the main question that uh, Shelby brought up is this, why study political economy? Um, first of all, uh, it's important to realize that capitalism is unfair and unequal. I think a lot of people in our society have come to that conclusion. A lot of young people are certainly very critical of capitalism and very favorable socialism, uh, but it's not sufficient uh, to understand its unfairness and inequality. Inequality, but we must also understand that the full range of the exploitive relationship uh, between capitalism and the working class in order to effectively struggle for socialism. So that's a key point to understand so that we can effectively struggle for socialism. Now, to fully understand capitalism, we must understand how one class lives off the back of another class. So capitalism is an exploitive, oppressive, undemocratic class system. So the key word here is, is, is class. It's a class system. And again, a uh, third point is it's not enough to gain understanding. We must act to uh, create change. And that's the whole point of this presentation is, is to understand, to create, help create change. Because we're building a shared future uh, together and we're doing it now. So uh, Nelson Mandela said that education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. I, I believe that to be very true. Uh, it's, it's about theory and practice, and they both go together. So what exactly is political economy? I think it's very important in whether it's you're talking about engineering, uh, as basic science, not the science of nature or society, that we start by defining our terminology because everybody uses these terms loosely and, 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 uh, and differently. So in this case, uh, by political economy, we're referring to the study of production, consumption, that is also called distribution, and transfer of wealth. So that is the topic uh, tonight. Uh, so where does the uh, uh, critique of political economy of capitalism uh, fall within the three basic foundations of scientific socialism? We certainly one of them. Think about uh, these three uh, foundations of scientific socialism as three legs of a stool. Uh, you can't stand with, uh, they, they all have to be in place. First one certainly overall is dialectical historical materialism. That is the, the uh, overview, the, uh, the big picture. Uh, of what's going on in nature and in society and how it changes and uh, why change comes about through a process of, uh, of contradictions and resolution. And it's a continuous cycle. And it's, everything's in motion. It's not nothing standing still. The, the other one is political economy, and we'll go into that in a few minutes. And the third one is the theory of socialist revolution. Overriding or on top, laying on top of all of this is the struggle for organization. So the three main ideas that I want to cover this evening is uh, uh, economics is the foundation for politics, culture, and ideas. This is not clearly understood by, by many people, even many people in our party, that uh, that is, is fundamental. Uh, if uh, it... Uh, all politics and culture and ideas, they all rest on economic foundations. 
So what kind of class uh, in the mode of production that we have? Alvaro, is, Alvaro, yes. this yes. is John. Do you yes, have slides? Do you have slides you're showing? Yes. Because we can't see them. Oh. You have to share them with us. Okay. Uh, good, Alvaro, good, good point. Wait. Good point. Okay. You, can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. I am sorry. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, so I am on slide six. Can you see it? Uh, John, can you, can you see slide six? Okay, hold on, Alvaro. Alvaro can you? Okay, we can't hear you all in the office. Okay. Uh, hold on, Alvaro. Sure. Um, Carrie? Yes. We're muted, so it's not asking, could you could you see the slide? Yes, we can. Okay. Very good. Okay, uh, you can hear me now, uh, and you can see slide number six. These are the three main ideas that, that we're covering tonight, that economics is the foundation for politics, uh, culture, and ideas. Uh, and, and this is why it's very important that we discuss this. The, the second is that capitalism is a wage theft system. It, uh, and the third is that capitalism creates the possibility and necessity of socialism. So it sounds not obvious that that is the case, but the, it does create the possibility and necessity of socialism. And this is very important when we think about the strategy and tactics in the struggle. Can you see my next slide now, number seven? Are you able to hear in Chicago? Everybody's muted. They're, everybody's muted. They see it. But oh, while, I see. Okay. While we broke again. Let me make Lance, Lance is also online. Let me, um, Lance, we'll open your mic uh, so that you can speak once uh, Alvaro has completed. Okay. Uh, this slide number seven uh, is just a quote from Karl Marx about economics as the foundation of politics, culture, and ideas. And in the German ideology, Karl Marx states that the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas, that is the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time, it's ruling intellectual force. So that is uh, that is something that's uh, sometimes not quite understood uh, by, by many of us. Was there something that a uh, question already, uh, D, that uh, we need to get into? Our comment? Not that I know of. Oh, I'm okay. not in the room. Oh, um, oh so okay. Very refer good. Your questions to Kerry. Okay, very good. Uh, okay, Let, let's go on with slide number eight. Uh, and uh, so, in, in the in the on the topic of economics as the foundation for politics, culture, and ideas, uh, let's talk about the primary human activity is production to satisfy basic needs such as food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, so you think about it, uh, most of our awake hours are spent at work trying to make ends meet. So when people say, what are you doing? I'm, I'm going to work, I'm coming back from work, I'm getting ready to go to work. That is the economy, that is the primary human activity associated uh, with economics. And the rest of the time, uh, the, the few hours that are left, uh, we're tending to home, family, and resting, and maybe trying to change the world. So uh, in the process of production, society has divided into related and conflicting classes, and this is fundamental to, to economics. Uh, we have uh, just very briefly uh, three modes of production. We're going to very briefly talk about the slavery mode of production, where we uh, have uh, the class, the slaves and the slave owners. We have the feudalist mode of production, we have serfs and land owners, and then we have the capitalist mode of production where, where we have workers and capitalists. And remember in all of these cases, the, the relationship is one of property. So the slaves uh, don't, don't own the plantation, those are owned by the slave owners who own also the slaves. The land owners uh, uh, own the land and the serfs only work on the land and tied to the land under the feudalist mode of production. And under capitalism, the capitalists own the means of production. Uh, workers sell their labor power uh, for wages uh, to the capitalists. 
So if you recall in the previous slide, the primary activity for workers directly and indirectly is the production of things such as food, clothing, and shelter. I also talked about indirectly, there's workers that are involved in, in the educational and, and, and uh, support functions. They're not directly involved at the point of production, but they all support the, the primary uh, uh, production activity. So uh, uh, the primary uh, activity again is the production of, of things such as food, clothing, and shelter. They're called commodities, also called products, goods, and services. So it doesn't matter whether you, you know what you call it, but they're all they're all associated with each other. Uh, services are definitely included in there. So what is a commodity? Anything made by humans that has both use value that that means they're useful to human beings. And they also have exchange value. They can be exchanged for something else. That's a commodity. Uh, I know that in common parlance, uh, commodities are, are, are just described as oil or pork bellies or, or, or corn and so forth. But it's we're talking about much more than that. We're talking about products, goods, and services. So what is the value of a commodity? This gets at the heart uh, of what we need to understand capitalism. It's the amount of socially necessary labor time, also called the labor theory of value, LTV. And this theory was developed by Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, uh, this classical political economist uh, in, the, in England uh, back in the 1700s, 1800s. And they were later updated by Karl Marx uh, with this, uh, you know, some, some understanding of, of what that is. But the bottom line here is that labor produces all value. This is obviously not the message you would get in the morning business channel. Uh, there, the message you get is that the value is produced by the free market uh, of the uh, equilibrium between uh, prices and demand, or that value is created by entrepreneurs or uh, 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 capital produces value. It's not true. It's 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 labor that produces value, uh, and and this is not just Karl Marx talking again. This, this was Adam Smith and David Ricardo and others. Obviously, some of them they changed some of their ideas as they went along, but uh, that's is the bottom line: is that labor produces all value. So, what is labor power? I know when I was uh, first starting to study. Uh, political economy, I, I was baffled by why Marx made such a distinction between labor and labor power, selling labor versus selling labor power. And what he, the distinction he was trying to make is something that's extremely valuable to an understanding of capitalism. That is, uh, labor power is the ability of a worker to produce more value, called surplus value, than it takes to support themselves and their family. So this is where uh, where the value of, la uh, of labor power comes in, that it can produce more value than, than, their, than they cost. So some questions associated with some of these terms. Um, uh, and so what is labor power? Is, or is labor power a commodity? Uh, the whole system of capitalist production itself is based on the fact that workers are compelled to sell their labor power as a commodity. So yes, under capitalism, labor power is bought and sold for wages and salaries in order to steal the surplus value created by workers. That's the only reason to, to uh, purchase uh, labor power. So what is surplus value? Again, it's, uh, it's, it's equal to the new value created by workers in excess of their own labor cost. This value is stolen by capitalists as profits when profit products or so. So the realization of the value created in the production process, the surplus value, the, the realization of that is only possible after the products are so. So this is very important and we'll discuss this, how this comes into the picture. So this is key. Surplus value is key to understanding capitalism. And the doctrine of surplus value is the cornerstone of Marxist economic theory. So if, if we want to understand Marxist economic theory, we certainly have to get, get a good understanding of what surplus value is. So what is capitalism then? It's a wage theft system. Capitalism only exists to steal surplus value from workers. Surplus value is the source of all wealth. Capitalism undermines kindness, cooperation, co community, freedom, and common purpose. It normalizes selfishness, inequality, and greed. So workers are also exploited, 
not only at the point of production, but also by the renters, the healthcare system, grocers, retailers, and, gov and government by shifting burden of taxation. So at this point, I'd like to give an example of the uh, what the theft of surplus value is. How, how does it how does it work? So let's take the case of a service employee. Uh, a fast food worker is hired and is flipping burgers and works 30 hours a week at about eight dollars an hour for about a total of 240 dollars a week. This is not far off the scale in Texas uh, here in Houston in the suburb. Uh, so some workers are making nine dollars an hour at McDonald's, but by and large, most workers work between minimum wage and, and about nine, ten dollars unless they are been there many years of experience. So anyway, let's say this fast food worker works uh, 30 hours a week. This is about you know on multiple shifts. This is what workers are doing because the employer doesn't want to pay them uh, uh, benefits, and uh, so they work less than 30 hours usually. If the worker makes enough burgers to pay for the $240 in wages and 10 hours of work, especially during the peak hours, that worker works for free for the next 20 hours that week. So that means that the burger corporation steals $480 from that worker each week or a rate of exploitation of 200%. So you just take the, uh, the number of hours that that worker works for free divided by the number of hours that that uh, go towards paying for, for the workers' uh, uh, wages, and that's the rate of exploitation. Um, one of the things about Marx uh, is that he set, didn't set out to be an economist. Uh, Marx set out to be a philosopher. He loved philosophy. He loved literature. So this comes across as you read uh, Capital. Uh, it reads like poetry in some cases. And uh, he uses a lot of metaphors. So here's one that I love. It comes from Capital, Volume 1. And I'm quoting Marx, uh, Marx saying here, Capital is dead labor. That vampire-like only lives by sucking living labor and lives the more, the more labor it sucks. So capitalism sucks, and uh, capitalism certainly is, uh, uh, is dead labor, and, and it's like a vampire. Um, so now let's get into this third uh, basic idea that capitalism serves to uh, creates the possibility and the necessity of socialism. So first of all, how does it do this? Uh, capitalism actually created the working class. This class will bring about forth a new economic and political system, socialism. So it's all, that was made possible by, by capitalism itself. Capitalism concentrates production and finance, uh, making socialism possible. So it's very difficult to develop socialism in, in uh, developing countries because the uh, capitalism hasn't finished uh, concentrating production uh, and financing. And all of this is, is very necessary for the production process and the realization of, of uh, surplus value for the working class. Uh, thirdly, uh, capitalism has uh, internal and inevitable contradictions uh, that facilitates its don't demise, but it does not fall on its own as we have found out over the uh, over the decades and the centuries. Um, but it does have this internal and inevitable contradictions. It, uh, and it, but it has to be given a push. It, uh, so in the absence of that push, uh, it will continue to shift and make accommodations and, 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 and make do. Uh, and here is where we talk about action and getting some things done. Uh, Karl Marx in the 18th Royal Mayor of Louis Bonaparte uh, talks about how people make uh, their own history. He says that people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but uh, rather under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. So we must understand uh, this process. This uh, next graphic, uh, slide 13, uh, I created this, this graphic and I added some things to it, trying to depict the loss of motion of capitalism and its internal contradictions. It's hard to do, I, I know this is an oversimplification, but we have to start somewhere uh, to get an understanding that 
capitalism is, 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 is has lost emotion. It it is always in motion. It cannot be at rest. If it's at rest, capitalism fails totally. The whole system falls apart. So let's start on the left hand side. It uh, uh, we're going to start here at the point of production. In this case, a representation of a factory. It could be anything. It can be a burger place. It can be anywhere where work is taking place. So here in the bottom side, you see the, the working class uh, working and producing commodities and surplus value. Then this surplus value and commodities, in order to realize the surplus value, uh, they have to be sold. So they, they uh, these commodities have to be purchased and consumed. But here is a key, key contradiction of capitalism, that the same people the working class that produces the commodities are at the same time the main consumer in society because the working class in the United States is approximately 300 million. The total population of the United States is about 326 million people. Uh, the ruling class is tiny. Someone made a calculation and they said that you could fit the ruling class of this country in Yankee Stadium. So it's less than about 50,000 uh, people. They, they consume some high ticket items. They, they, you know, they, they, they are, they're high consumers per population, but overall, the purchasing power is quite small. It's a working class with its 300 million. Uh, that includes workers uh, and their families, retirees, and so forth. They're the main purchasers, and they are the ones that that are they have to purchase these commodities in order to generate the surplus value and the wealth. Once the surplus value has been realized in the form of profits, then a portion of it goes towards the accumulation of more wealth for the capitalist class, and some of it's returned back into the into the uh, into the pro, in the capitalist process in the in the form of of reinvestment. Uh, some of the capital goes back in the reinvestment. Some of it is actually borrowed. Actually, nowadays, most capital that's used in production is borrowed. So that's when they say that, that corporations, uh, monopoly corporations are highly leveraged, means that they're, they, they get credit. They run on credit. They have to create this, they have to get this credit because from the time they have to purchase raw materials and labor power and, uh, and machinery and so forth, uh, and capital improvements uh, and the time they actually get paid after the commodities are purchased and sold, that, that can be two or three months. So they have to borrow from the banks. They're he heavily uh, dependent on the banks uh, for their uh, to keep this uh, capital cycle uh, going. So what is the driving force for this, this movement, this uh, capitalist movement? Uh, the driving force is constant competition between and with uh, 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 for maximum profits and maximum return on capital. The second part of this is, is not quite well understood. But capitalists not only compete with other capitalists that are, they're, they're in the same business or for the same, uh, in the same market. They have to compete with all capitalists for maximum return on capital. So let's say this capitalist here on the right-hand side doesn't think that this particular factory produces sufficient or maximum return on capital, they'll just shift their money to another industry. They don't care whether they're in the business of making burgers or automobiles or lumber or paper. It, it doesn't matter to them. It, it's, it's all a question of maximum return on capital. So keep that in mind that uh, this is the main driver for this. And it's also the driver that leads to this, this, this problem with the crisis of capitalism. Now, something that's not covered in uh, in Volume One of Capital, but it's very important to the uh, to understand the crisis of capitalism, is Marx uh, talks about in Volume Three. I think is on the tendency for the for the rate of profit to fall. So I, I just call it falling rate of profit. So here's a graphic that was put together by our Marxist uh, economists, and you have to take data from the uh, Natural Bureau of Economic Research and the Bureau of e Economic Research, e e Economic Analysis. Uh, and he put the data together to try and get an idea of what was happening to the rate of profit. 
And this is data that is created uh, from 1947 to 2016. And it shows that after the war, uh, the rate of profits start falling. As you can see in 1948 or so, see the rate of profits is higher than 35%. It start dropping and it got to be a real crisis in the 60s and 70s. This is where a shift took place. This is in the 1980s under uh, Reagan and Thatcher. Uh, this is where neoliberalism came into the picture. Uh, so what is neoliberalism? Again, it's just this, the start of a higher rate of worker exploitation. It involves offshoring jobs to other uh, low-wage countries, wage cuts, austerity, fiscal austerity, austerity on the job, uh, cuts in benefits, uh, uh, decreases in uh, taxation for, for the corporations and the rich, uh, and so forth, trying to overcome this uh, or, uh, or remedy this tendency for the rate of profit to fall. And sure enough, uh, after neoliberalism was incorporated, not only in the United States, but in the UK and abroad and in other countries, uh, then you start having uh, the rate of profit start increasing. But here is one that, that covers the same area, and this, the calculations are done by different people with different methods. But so after the uh, new, uh, neoliberalism took place, you can see where the, the rate of profit start recovering, right? The neoliberalist recovery. But then uh, it start going down again. And in 2008, it took a dramatic drop because of the 2008 financial economic crisis. Uh, it recovered after that, but it's, it's still going down now. Here is another graphical depiction of the loss of motion of capitalism. I created this one to, to show again some of the same, same thing, but it starts here on the left-hand side. Let me put my pointer on it. It starts on number one here. Capitalist competition for maximum market share and return on capital is the main driver for, for this, this process. You add higher labor productivity through automation. Uh, that that uh, creates a downturn in prices and the fall in the rate of profit. That leads to a, cap, a capitalist counter reaction, cutting weight, jobs, lowering wages, cost reductions in order to increase the rate of profit. The working class, 300 or so million, has less disposable income, consuming less. This leads to a cyclical economic crisis of overproduction, restricted consumption, leading to cumulative worsening economy and leading to worsening political crisis. So while this, show, this graphic does show a circular motion, it's more like a funnel. It's, it's more like a spiral. So social labor creates surplus value, which in turn is stolen by individual capitalists. This leads for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction leads to mass resistance. And this leads to a downward spiral to capitalism's obsolescence, uh, making socialism possible and uh, necessary. So some of the main takeaways uh, from this uh, topic tonight uh, is, first of all, that economics is the foundation for politics and the battle of ideas. So think about the class struggle is fundamental. Capitalism is the root cause of wars, uh, racism, inequality, inadequate health care, low standard living for most working people, and much more. Capitalism is a system of wage theft. It is an exploited system. But so what can we do about it? Certainly can join your union, fight for higher wages, ask your co-workers and fellow activists to join the Communist Party in the fight for our future and socialism. Now, while capitalism create, you know, uh, thirdly is that that uh, while capitalism creates the conditions for socialism, the multiracial, multinational, multigender working class and its communist party must give it a shove. And that's the final takeaway from the class. So, Dee, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, 
I think we are ready to take on uh, comments and, and questions at this point. Perhaps you can help me moderate. Our mic is open here. We have a question from Harold. Yes, my first question is all, uh, involved the explanation, the first explanation you gave in regards to uh, the surplus value created. What seemed to be left out was the initial investment that the capitalists make. Now, because they, he has to put in something uh, uh, in order to, to, to achieve this. So he has to, and, and that has to be deducted from that surplus value that he gets. So it does reduce the amount. And that's going to, to come into play whenever you talk about, whenever you give an example like this, you have to include that portion that the capitalists initially invest. It might be very little, but it does have to be accounted for. Yes, uh, if you think about it from a, from a theoretical viewpoint, uh, I think we, we have to uh, think about uh, capital is just dead labor, right? So it was surplus value created in the previous cycle of production. So capital, the original investment, uh, today most of that capital comes from the banks, the financial institutions, which where do they get the money from? It usually comes from retire, retirement accounts. It, it, it comes from uh, investments from investors from all over the world. But it, it was uh, all this money and wealth that was created in previous cycles of production. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let, let me just, so I can be clear. Grants, let me give you an example of what I'm getting at. Uh, say, for instance, I buy an old junk car. Okay. It costs, it costs a thousand dollars. It doesn't run, but I know Shelby. Shelby comes over and fixes the car up, man. And, and I have to give him some money for some of the parts. I have to give him money for the for the for the uh, paint and whatnot. And then along comes John. John said, "I really like this car. I will give you four thousand dollars for it." Okay. Now. Uh, Say my investment of initial thousand dollars, I want that back. Plus, I want the two hundred dollars or so that I put in for Shelby to fix it up, to, to fix it up, and then I want to pay Shelby maybe a hundred dollars. So I think all of those deductions have to be made. Still, my 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 surplus value is going to be the wage step is still going to be what three thousand. You're a rascal. Yeah, I am. Three thousand. The capital is on. Rascals. And <clears throat> but still my 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 stuff will be what about three thousand dollars that I've taken from Shelby? She, who really owns the car really? Shelby's made it made it worth something. All I had was a piece of junk that nobody wanted. But now since I did I did pay for the thousand dollars, I did buy the paint and parts and whatnot from Shelby that Shelby told me told me that I needed. Say that they cost two hundred dollars all together, and so that means I put twelve hundred dollars into the car. Shelby made it worth four thousand dollars. Oh, that's the surplus value. Yeah. So, so John is really to pay, willing to pay four thousand dollars for this car. I've only invested twelve hundred dollars, so I'm going to get my twelve hundred dollars back plus whatever I paid Shelby. So I think we have to include the, the, that investment that they still, the, 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 the capitalist is getting over like a, a bandit, which he is, but I think we have to include that in the explanation. I got a car that Shelby could work on. <laughs> <laughs> but we we got to keep in mind as we discuss uh, surplus value that uh, there's a difference between uh, price and value. Price is 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 price is 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 what something a commodity gets in the marketplace based on, on the loss of supply and demand. It uh, so if there's a shortage of uh, a re recovered re restored cars, then it it. it of that particular model, it drives the prices up, but that that that's not directly related to the uh, value, labor value in the in that car. So there, there, there are two different mechanisms, and and uh, what Marx was talking about at a much more fundamental level 
uh, about the the process of, of capitalism itself it doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, uh dealing with the issue of 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 prices and and so forth and i know that you're gonna have to deal with that absolutely yeah you have to deal with that and uh, but we just make sure we need to make sure that we keep those things uh uh in separate compartments of our brain that uh, they're they're uh uh, people can make profit. People can make profit uh, it, it, without actually involving any production. They just get you know, to take care uh, of buying. Uh, you can say buy low and sell high, uh, without actually involving production. Some some people, some distributors make money just from uh, from taking opportunities in, in the difference in between the the supply and demand. And uh, but that in the long term, that all evens out. It's it's not fundamental to the economy all the time. <laughs> Bankers do it all the time. Next, yes. Let me stop. <laughs> Next question from B. Lumpkin. Oh, I wanted to comment on what Harold said, and that is that the materials for the production, repair, whatever, that are supplied by the capitalists transfer their value to the finished product, but they do not create additional value. And since the, the uh, technology has become a more important factor in production, uh, the capitalist may have to supply more than when machines were simple. So all of that transferred its value, but only labor creates new value. And I think that's what is meant by wage theft. Yes, absolutely right. That, that, that's, a very, that's a very clear uh, description of, of the process. Uh, also, this material they use in production, the raw materials, uh, the equipment, and so forth, that's also uh, was bought with, uh, with uh, surplus value generated in, previous cycle, in the previous cycle of production. That's also produced by labor and it carries with it uh, some, uh, some value. It, uh, but I, I think that what's muddled in, in the discussion today is it, it, where the value is placed on entrepreneurship or or innovation or a motivation and so forth is I, th I like to use a very a simple simple situation but I think it's it, it illustrates the point if you take debt capital in the form of money and you go to the bank and borrow a million dollars and put it in a closet and come back in a month and see how much more additional money it created, how much additional value it created, you'll find out it didn't create any additional value. At least inside the closet, it doesn't, right? So it's only in the process of production and in, in the process of creating surplus value that it, that, it, that it creates value. So inside the closet, the million dollars actually does nothing at all. So you say, well, yeah, but uh, Capital has to be included with uh, a capitalist has to be involved, a highly creative capitalist. Let's say we put Steve Jobs in there with a one million dollars, and we'll see if if coming out of that closet you see a whole bunch of iPhones coming out. You'll you'll see that that, that is not going to happen. iPhones are not even produced in this country; produced in China by Chinese workers. <laughs> and, uh, and 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 so even if you put somebody like Steve Jobs, a uh, salesman, in there uh an ingenious one uh you're still not going to have any iphones um so let's say you add some machinery in there now you add some production machinery and semiconductor machinery to produce uh, iphones and you put steve jobs in there it's still not going to happen he doesn't know anything about making iphones uh he's a salesman he needs uh, engineers workers and others to to create the value so they can create an iphone so these are illustrations of, of if you take individual variables out of the equation, you see there's there 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 is no value. It's it's workers that add the value. There's no question about that in my mind. Uh, uh, hold on a second, Lance. You're able to uh, uh, participate in the discussion. 
you are now your phone your uh mic is now muted all you have to do is click your mic to open it you can control it yourself so when you speak click your mic to open it and when you're done click your mic to close it uh somebody in the room needs to uh, m uh moderate the conversation uh uh so that we can uh move along okay next question from scotty yeah um it's actually not a question i just want to make a point um there is there is the philosophical and the um the manifesto and the, the i mean capital and all of that um but it really has to be simplified and modified so that we can actually use it with workers on the job a lot of this stuff would seem very esoteric and not not understanding at the very time that more and more workers are wondering about what the hell's going on and why are we getting beaten up and why is you know how does all this stuff work and i just want to recommend a, a book i haven't finished reading it what's interesting about this book is it's a um, kind of a, a, a very modern, simple explanation of some of the basic concepts of Marxism. Um, and he, he mentions Marx, but he, he more goes into how to explain Marxist economics to people without jargon and with, with just a modern understanding of what they're talking about. And uh, I haven't finished it yet, but the other thing that's important about this book, and it's very much, the, the book is entitled, Can the Working yeah. Class Change the World? And his basic premise is, that's the only hope for the human race, is that we have to change the world, and that more and more, it, people are beginning to see that. So he's really trying to give, well, let me just say, this book is being circulated, it's by a guy named Michael Yates. It's being circulated by unions. And yet what this book is talking about is how do we get to socialism? How do we how do how do the working and it's not just socialism in the United States, how globally do we deal with the fact of global capital? How do you deal with that for workers kind of thing? It's a whole and again, I I've only read the first part of it, but I the fact that for example, where I heard about it was from a, a union newsletter because they were they were they were suggesting that their members read this and and begin to understand this. So down below, and you know, a lot of things show this, people are more and more thinking about what's the way out of this? How are we going to get? And more and more people are turning towards socialism as an idea. And that's what they're reinforcing with this. And I think I think that's the most important thing. We have to be able to go talk on the shop floor to the people we work with and the people that are beginning to turn towards socialism, giving them the way to explain that uh, to people and to the people that they work with. So anyway, I, I highly recommend people reading that book. Thank you, Scotty. That, that's, uh, that's a very important point. Uh, when we are involved in some of this Marxist classes, we're, 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 teach, we're doing classes for people in the party. Uh, and we're doing classes for uh, to gain understanding among activists and so forth, uh, but uh, this is not what we're we're not saying that this is a way to to teach this material to to explain this material uh, to everybody. We have to be able to popularize our uh, our content and put it out in the forms that are easily accessible to to different audiences. And uh, so I think that, but we got to start with uh, with understanding fundamentals, and then be able then to explain it in different ways uh, and accessible to a lot more different different uh, audiences. Thank you, Scotty. Okay, next is Miguel. Miguel. Uh, so, so to uh, Scotty's point, I think one of the challenges when trying to present this material to people everywhere is the point that was made clearly earlier about that the worker working class really makes the vast almost entirety of the US population where you said that 300 million of us are workers and right. not everybody sees themselves as, as part of the working class when in fact they are and one of the things is a whole 
point about how you mentioned how commodity, labor is commodity, workers are commodities. Yes. That's one way in which you make a connection to people who feel like that you are a worker. Because even in, in the corporate world, right? Say you're an accountant or whatever, you're a banker. Right. When you, when you get a job, they actually give you an offer letter that tells you how much you're worth. And you can either say yes or no, negotiate, and then people move their careers in the corporate world. You know, I have a, I have a sister who just uh, works for American Bar Association, and she gets offer letters, you know, saying, we're offering you. And that that's a more, more you know, perfect example that you are a commodity. Even if whatever work you're doing, 300 million of us are commodities, we're workers, we're part of the working class. And I really like that piece. Just That's my comment. I think that's one way for us to explain it to the outside and everybody else. Doesn't, yes. you know, doesn't, doesn't that's really it. That's, an that's a very important point, uh, Miguel. It, um, so, uh, yeah, sometimes we don't, we, we, we're not clear on, on what a working class is. Uh, some people say, well, explain that to me. I mean, some people don't want a, a very theoretical explanation about the means of production, the property relations, and all that. That sounds very esoteric. But if you can explain like this, uh, if you re create a uh, tax return, and you have to report based on a W-2 form. You're probably a worker. If, if you get, if you report using a 1099 uh, capital, uh, you have to report the majority of, of your income comes from capital gains and dividends. You're probably a capitalist. That that's that's not the majority of the population. Um, but I, I think that we have to find easier explanations uh, that people would uh, associate with it and understand. Uh, some people think, well, teachers are, are not uh, members of the working class, or nurses are not members of the working class, or, or white-collar workers are not members of the working class, or unless you're a blue-collar worker, you're not a member of the working class. That's not true. Uh, you're a member of the working class as long as you, are, you have to hire your services out, you sell your labor power, then you are a member of the working class and you're part of the capitalist system uh, uh, of production. And uh, so that that is we have to find different ways to explain that uh, to, to our, our working class. And remember that uh, I, I remember something that Mark Twain said one time. It's not so much what you don't know, he said, it's what you think you know and you're sure of that's not true. And, and, the, and the capitalist class, remember, they, they're, they're the manufacturers of ideas in our society. They're the, the, the primary manufacturer of ideas. Their first idea is there's no such thing as classes. We don't have a class society. We have a meritocracy in, this in our society where if you, you raise yourself by your bootstraps based on motivation, hard work, and innovation, and, and, uh, and, and the capitalist system. And, and uh, so... So uh, a lot of people buy into this. How could they not? They, that's what they, they hear in, in the classroom. That's what they hear in the newspaper. This is what they hear in the news every day. So uh, everywhere they, they hear the same, the same uh, myths. And uh, so they believe a lot of this. Uh, uh, how could it be, not be otherwise? So this is what we have to deal with is all these false ideas that are implanted in people's uh, minds. And, and they don't offer an explanation why is the working class in the shape that it's in, why are, why are many you know, workers and, and other and 30 some million people voting for Trump. It, it, it's not, there's no explanation power from that. I have a question. Oh, hold on a second, hold on a second. Um, Lance, your mic is open. Do you want to say something? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. We oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, you know, I, I belong to a, a, a couple of groups. Uh, one's a community organization, the other's a union. And, you know, uh, everybody's busy. Everybody's got things to do. <laughs> they have to rush through this, rush through that. I'm trying to figure a way to make it, you know, to say something about how important socialism is within a very short period of time. And I'm not quite certain how to go about this and, uh, or just to experiment and do. Do you have any uh, understanding of, uh, of just some short sentences? Because a lot of people really don't like to go to class, <laughs> especially some of the people I know. They, they, they have enough class already. So they, they just want to hear something in, in a few short sentences or maybe a paragraph. 
what would you say to an opening when somebody says, what, what can I do about this system? Uh, yes, thank you, Lance. Um, what I what I tell people, I, I, if I have to do an elevator speech, I think all of us have to have a short elevator speech. I, I don't know if you know that concept, but the concept is that if you cannot explain it while you're right in the elevator in, in, a, in a matter of a minute or two, uh, then you may not know what you're talking about. So uh, we have to have uh, short explanations, and then we have to have thorough and, and better understand the explanations. So when it comes to socialism, one of the best definitions that I like very much is the working class in power, in full power. So the working class, we said, is the majority of the population. We want the working class to have full power over their work and over their surplus value so that it's used for the common good. So I think if we can hone that down and, and, and popularize it, I think that's a message that we want to say. Um, we don't want to oversimplify life because life is complicated uh, and it, it's naturally so. Um, take uh, Marx, in, in the introduction to Capital One, he, Marx says that, that understanding and, and gaining insight is like climbing a mountain, a summit. It's very tough getting to the top. You know, it takes a lot of work. There are no shortcuts in, in getting to the top of the mountain. And but you can look a lot further out once you get up there. So it's worth the effort. But there there is no substitute for putting effort into it. Whether it's in in the in the classroom in trying to gain understanding of the big picture, or whether uh, uh, or, or 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 how to fight in, in, in the different political struggle, economic struggles, and so forth, we, we have to gain understanding, and we gain it usually from experience. And uh, so you have to relate to people's experience, and, and that's how you create a good explanation. Well, that's my opinion, anyway. Okay. Okay. Uh, next, uh, I'm on, I'm on. Okay, I wanted to just mention like once the uh, automation gets uh, more and more involved in production, then the fact that that's going to mean that there's fewer and fewer people that would be needed to create the wealth, isn't that what you say? And so will that help socialism to come into being more so because <laughs> the uh, distribution People with a lot of people that will not be working over after a while because automation is doing their job, then they have to still have certain resources and things and so buying power. So how how is that going to play into the whole situation? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the issue of automation, higher productivity. So every year we have a higher and higher productivity in this country. That means that more commodities are produced per worker than before. And that's done through automation to the use of machinery. So using automation, uh, you're able to produce much more goods and less workers. But what that does is that reduces the, the, the size of the, of the consumption group. I mean, the, the, it produces, reduces the income of the, of the main uh, consumer. It, uh, and also drives the prices down uh, but but it, it cheapens it and it creates a crisis in capitalism itself. So automation uh, is going to be good for socialism, though, because it, it will be able to ensure that we produce enough commodities in the country, and especially in underdeveloped uh, or developing countries, to meet their basic needs. And in this country, we need more basic needs in the area of healthcare and other services, infrastructure, and so forth. But... Uh, but what we want to do is, uh, we we do want we like the idea of cheapening. Uh, that is, uh, how much labor has to go into commodities, in order for us to afford what we need with less effort. The idea certainly is to reduce the working hours. The solution to automation is to reduce the working hours. I think socialism will offer the possibilities, and then the next stage, ca communism, will offer the possibilities of reducing the hours of labor. Uh, reducing back uh, breaking work, uh, it, and that will all be done more from will be done by machinery and and uh, and computers, uh, so that we can devote our time to the things that are really important in our lives, the community, our families, uh, and our uh, for things that gives us joy in our life, 
uh, instead of uh, having to have multiple jobs, uh, 30 hour jobs, or so we can make ends meet. So I think the promise uh, of socialism is also the promise of, of automation is to ensure that the surplus value goes to meet people's working class basic needs, that we have a sustainable economy so that we don't have to consume to be happy and that we can uh, meet our basic needs and be happy with uh, without having to destroy the, the, the ecology and, and, the, uh, and the environment. So I think that, that that's all promised. Uh, so uh, automation right now is a problem for the working class under capitalism, but it's going to be shows tremendous promise under socialism. But then as more and more people are not holding down jobs, then they don't have any real buying power. So how do they how, do, how are they able to get items to supply their needs because they don't have buying power? I think it's as 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 yeah under capitalism is 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 a big problem as 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 workers are laid off in order to uh, to produce more goods with less labor uh, then it cheapens the products and drives prices down leading to a conflict a, a problem of overproduction and underconsumption it uh, so I I think that the solution has to be what we have always proposed in the past is that we have to put forth the slogan saying that we need to reduce the hours of the week, uh, the hours of the, uh, the, the party uh, was heavily involved in, in, in the left movement was heavily involved in the fight for the eight hour day. Uh, we have to have that, that what one solution is to go ahead and reduce the, law, the number of hours uh, without reduction in pay. So we have to come up with some of these uh, solutions. The, the the problem is not the the machine, it's not the automation. It's the it's the system. Okay, well, thank you, Alvaro. That was a great discussion we had. We really uh, uh, appreciate you facilitating it, and yeah. hopefully we can call you back again and, and talk about. It. Oh, same yes, I get, I get th thank you for the invitation, Shelby. And, uh, and uh, if you have any more questions, you have my email there on the screen. Right. Uh, send it to me. And I hope that this first, the discussions that we need so that we can dig into some of this uh, very, very important questions that everybody has in their mind. Thank right. you very much. And everybody have a good evening. Bye -bye. Thank you.